Uh, it, I guess it's the day after, you know, a break, so we have a small group today, but a small but uh, exceptional group today. <laughs> um, so first of all, I have a couple of announcements. Um, you may not be aware that Penn State has its own Latin American music group called Los Tiquis, and Los Tiquis will be performing 100 years of Violeta Parra, an event to commemorate the Chilean folk artist's centennial. And this will uh, be performed on Friday this week, December 1st, at 5 p.m. in 112 Kern Building, right, right in this very building. Um, then we have um, a couple of events related to the topic of human rights fracking and the struggle for representation. So there will be a lecture on Friday, December 1st. Rob Nixon, who is the author of Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor. And this will be at 4 p.m. in Foster Auditorium. And then also on Friday at 7.30 p.m., a fiction reading uh, by Jeanette Hay, author of Heat and Light. And then Saturday, December 2nd at 7.30 p.m., there will be screening of a film entitled Invisible Hand, followed by question and answer. And that will also be in Foster Auditorium. So if you have any uh, questions, you can direct your questions to uh, Rose over here. And her name's on the flyer, right? So. Okay, and then finally, our last conflict lecture of the semester will be next Monday. And our speaker will be Melanie Nicholson, professor of Spanish and Latin American literature at Bard College. And her topic will be Reading the Beast, a brief look at the modern literary beast, Jerry. That will be next Monday. OK, so today we have a discussion of the work of Kazuo Ishiguro, who is the winner this year of the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, he is a British author who was born in Japan, but his family moved to Britain when he was five years old. And we have today four of our local, uh, four of our colleagues here to discuss uh, various aspects of uh, Ishiguro's work. So let me introduce uh, the folks who are going to be talking today. So on the end here, on my far left, we have Christopher Reed who is a professor of English, Visual Culture, and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Then uh, next to him we have John Abel, uh, who is an associate professor of Comparative Literature and Japanese. And then next we have Caroline Eckhart, professor uh, in the Department of Comparative Literature and English, and head of the School of Languages and Literatures. And last but not least, fresh from a flight from Beirut to State College, yeah. we have Hannah, uh, sorry, Anna Zika Stanton, who is an assistant professor of comparative literature and Arabic literature. So she informs us that because she's still jet lagged, she can't be held personally responsible Apologies. for anything that she says today. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start uh, on the end here with Christopher Reed uh, from the Department of English, uh, as, as well as Visual Culture, Women's Gender, and Sexuality Studies. So uh, take it away, Chris. All right, it must be tough to win a Nobel Prize, right? Because somebody shows, I, I, do you think it's like when you win the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes and they show up with balloons? <clears throat> but in any case, somebody shows up and offers you $8 million and then every academic in the world goes, really, that person? Um, <laughs> So, uh, and I looked at the announcement from the Nobel Prize Committee, which said that uh, Ishiguro um, had won uh, because of, because, quote, in novels of great emotional force, he has uncovered the abyss beneath our illusory sense of connection with the world, which I have to say is a phrase that reminds me of one of the fav favorite things that it was ever said to me by an undergraduate in a class, it was a freshman seminar and I had wrapped up some, I don't know, ginormous point about Virginia Woolf, and I said, so what do you think about that? And some girl, because she was still a freshman and hadn't learned to behave herself yet, said, 
I don't know, that seems a little faux deep. And that phrase faux deep kind of, kind of came back to me when I read the, the Nobel Prize thing there. Um, uh, so, uh, so I thought I would talk about uh, the first three of Ishiguro's novels, uh, one of which I like enormously, and one of which I don't like at all, um, and just try to sort of get us, get us going with the sort of academic thing that, that we do of assessing things critically. So the first, uh, second, and third novels, I would argue, are um, really about Ishiguro's situation of displacement, um, and his specific situation of displacement as a Japanese abroad in the second half of the um, 20th century. And I wouldn't really characterize this as a situation of diaspora, because, um, because there weren't a lot of upper middle class Japanese families who moved to the United Kingdom um, in, uh, and to, to an upper middle class suburb of London in the 1950s. So it's not like he's part of some sort of larger diaspora population, but rather um, he's in a more, uh, a different kind of situation, a kind of situation of isolation and I think responsibility to kind of perform a Japanese-ness that um, his family clung to. They didn't see themselves as immigrants. They saw themselves as temporarily in Britain, although in fact they ended up staying. So he moved there when he was five and never went back to Japan until long uh, into his adulthood. But they, you know, they ate Japanese food at home, they spoke Japanese at home. There, there, there was, as I said, they didn't think of themselves um, as immigrants. So he's a kind of representative of a place that in some ways he knows only through his parents. Um, uh, and, and yet have to kind of um, perform uh, as uh, his own uh, identity. Um, so his first novel, A Pale View of Hills, was published in 1982, um, and, uh, and it's kind of set in that situation. It's told from the perspective of a Japanese woman who has immigrated uh, to the UK, um, with, uh, and it's uh, after the suicide <coughs> of her daughter, and, um, uh, and kind of reflects on that situation. And uh, it was well received, but it was really the next two novels, and it's those that I want to focus on, um, that, uh, that made uh, Ishiguro famous. So the first one, wait, I have a visual. Uh, the first one is this one, An Artist of the Floating World. I'm sure there are people here who have read this. Charlotte, I bet you've read it, yes. Anybody else? Yes, yeah, we've got some other nodding hands. And um, I've read it a number of times because I've taught it a number of times, and it t I think it teaches well. I taught it with John in a class that we uh, taught together. It's a novel that I like a lot. Um, uh, it's set in very specifically in the late 1940s. The chapters are titled with specific months and dates. This one is October 1948, um, for instance. Um, and yet there's a weird kind of sloppiness about the dating because there's a whole sort of plot line about the little kid who likes the Godzilla movies which didn't come out until the mid-1950s. So, um, and, you know, I kind of can't decide whether that's on purpose, but it's, <laughs> but it's interesting um, uh, in, the, in this way of kind of representing a fantasy Japanese-ness. Um, and the thing that it does, which, which was begun in the Pale View of Hills, is uh, has a kind of, uh, it certainly has a first person sort of retrospective narrator who's telling the story uh, very much from, uh, in this case, his position. And his position is as an artist who you gradually fi find out was a propagandist and quite an enthusiastic pro fascist propagandist during World War II. And so um, there are sort of interesting, um, and in the period leading up to World, during the Pacific War in the 30s, um, and in the, uh, it's got a, a very interesting kind of dynamic where you identify with the artist, I think, for a while until you don't. Um, and part of the, you know, part of that is that we like Buildings Roman stories, right? We like stories of an artist development who, um, Kunstler Roman, which it even calls, where you know a guy becomes more famous and more uh, satisfied with his lot in life and overcomes hurdles, and and so you're kind of encouraged to identify with it, even as you start to realize that the way that he's advancing is uh, through this kind of fascist propaganda. And one of the things that I'm interested in is the way that it uses kind of cliches of Japanese aesthetics to uh, get us engaged with that. So that the opening um, paragraph 
uh, is, and I think, I think this is interesting because of the way it interpolates the reader and, because it, and, and it sort of gets us on board with, a, with, a, with an aestheticized view of Japan. If on a sunny day you climb the steep path leading up from the little wooden bridge, still referred to around here as the Bridge of Hesitation, you will not have to walk far before the roof of my house becomes visible between the tops of two ginkgo trees. Even if it did not occupy such a commanding position on the hill, the house would still stand out from all others nearby, so that as you come up the path, you may find yourself wondering what sort of wealthy man owns it. So we're certainly interpolated as someone who's curious about the author, and you know, it, it opens up into a very kind of cliched idea of beautiful Japanese aesthetics. But then, as I said, it goes this very kind of complicated place because, because we become increasingly alienated from this figure that we've been um, asked to identify with. But there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of sort of layers in it, and particularly his relationship to his children, I think is very interesting. They're, you know, they're very anxious to put the war behind them, including putting him behind them, to the point where his son-in-law keeps sort of not that subtly suggesting that he commits suicide. Um, so there's a sense that the, you know, that the new age, the age of the occupation, is as kind of ruthless as the age that he um, came up in, and, um, and that their accommodation to this new order is in some ways as corrupt as his accommodation um, or even enthusiasm for and an identification with um, the fascist order that came before. All right, and uh, so this book was quite successful. It did win some prizes, but it was the next book, the third book, The Remains of the Day from 1989, that really made him internationally famous. And you can tell that by the fact that on this paperback edition, you know, it says, Kazuo Shiguro, an artist of the floating world, and then by the author of The Remains of the Day. So clearly that's the one that we're supposed to have heard of. It was turned into a Hollywood um, movie starring Emma Thompson and Anthony Hopkins. It got eight Academy Award nominations. So that's, that's the novel that really made him famous. It's extremely similar to An Artist in the Floating World. Um, the preface establishes a date, in this case July 1956 is the title of the preface. It's also a reliable uh, narr narration by an unreliable narrator, in this case a butler in a kind of stately home. Uh, to us it would remind us of um, Downton Abbey, although of course that came afterwards. But Downton Abbey is uh, very much based on a 1970s TV show that the elders may remember called uh, Upstairs Downstairs, which was the masterpiece theater for years. Um, and, uh, and that was in the 1970s and clearly informed Ishiguro's idea of Englishness. He also talks about being uh, inspired by the Jeeves character in P.G. Woodhouse novels. And so he's sort of chosen what, what seems to be a kind of quintessential British character of the butler in the stately home um, to occupy the position that in the Japanese novel was occupied by the Japanese artist. And, um, uh, and, and he uses um, particular kinds of the same kind of strategies. Uh, so I'm going to read a paragraph from this in which the butler is talking about looking out over the British countryside, and I think it parallels with the paragraph that I read from the artist of the floating world. Um, uh, he says, um, sorry, uh, uh, see, I wanted to have all of this printed out because then I can just kind of scan it, and unfortunately my computer wouldn't, they, decided my password wasn't right and I didn't have time to fix it before I came over here. And I know I put it in these damn notes. Here it is. All right. All right. He said, when I stood on that high ledge this morning and viewed the land before me, I distinctly felt that one is in the presence of greatness. We call this land Great Britain, and I would venture that the landscape of our country alone justifies the use of this lofty adjective. So it really, it, again, it has a kind of cliched use of aesthetics to bring you into the, um, the artist's, uh, the, the narrator's worldview. But I kind of hate Remains of the Day, and I, uh, in trying to think about how I was going to talk about that today, I, I think the only way that I like it is to think of it as a kind of angry novel. Um, an ang much angrier than, than an artist of the floating world, which really seems like a kind of rumination on people's uh, implicability in the era that they live in. But it's almost like 
having been forced to represent Japan in that way, he's now doing almost a satire of it um, for the British um, context. Picking this cliched sort of British fi figure off of a uh, you know, sort of uh, soap opera of the stately manor home, using these very sort of cliched ideas about Britishness. Uh, he brings you in the same kind of way, and then the butler has all these sort of uh, terrible, you know, sort of prejudiced ideas about people who aren't British. And it turns out he was the butler for a British lord who was uh, very strongly in favor of accommodating the Nazis. And so it has the same sort of backwards um, corruption, but there's nothing there's nothing about the younger generation. It doesn't ask any kinds of hard questions about Britons of Ishiguro's uh, kind of own age. And I'm just going to read you one more short passage, which is from the conclusion, which kind of encapsulates why, why I either hate this or why I think it's a very sort of uh, clever, mean book that then people didn't understand was a clever, mean book. Um, so this is. Uh, from the, the very end of it, and you'll see that it has the phrase, the remains of the day in it, so it's sort of the place where the novel is building up to uh, explain its title. And here the butler is kind of looking back over having, you know, over this, this career of uh, serving this guy very proudly, this guy who was uh, an appeaser of the Nazis. And he says to himself, after all, what can we ever gain in forever looking back and blaming ourselves if our lives have not turned out quite as we might have wished? The hard reality is surely that for the likes of you and I, there is little choice other than to leave our fate ultimately in the hands of those great gentlemen at the hub of the world who employ our services. So in addition to this sort of like, you know, the people in charge are the people in charge thing, you know, and we've certainly learned to be skeptical of those sentiments through the kind of reading of the book. Um, uh, the, the, there's a kind of um, hideous grammar error, the sort of, the surely for the likes of you and I, that for a butler who prided himself on his constant proper self-presentation, um, I think, you know, sort of betrays any kind of reality to the character. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's, it's sort of imagining how a book about a British butler might be written by a kind of careless American. Um, and the kind of interesting thing about both books is that when you stand back about them, both of them are actually about accommodating to American culture. Because the Japan, of course, that he's writing about an artist of the floating world is the Japan of the occupation. And the new owner of Darlington Mansion is an American who keeps wanting to quote unquote banter with his butler. And the butler tries to listen to the radio to understand what banter is so that he can have that kind of conversation um, with, this, with this vulgar American. So in some ways, I feel like that, uh, uh, the remains of the day is a kind of bantering with us, a kind of vulgarization of the themes and ideas uh, of an artist in the floating world, and the fact that it became a major motion picture and super famous and was uh, nominated for eight Academy Awards shows that we kind of didn't get it. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if that's just my reading. Well, I'm not even sure that that's just my reading. But that's, those are some of, the, some of the kind of currents that I see in the beginning of Ishiguro's career. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll turn the floor over to John Abel. So uh, we're moving chronologically through, through the career here. We'll skip about uh, a decade. Um, but it's the decade of the 90s in which the novel I'm going to talk about takes place. Uh, but it's an alternate universe uh, 90s in which uh, a kind of uh, speculative fiction uh, world has uh, produced a, a Great Britain where uh, a entire group of people, a generation of people, uh, are raised as uh, organ donors, uh, the clones of, of uh, uh, I guess, regular citizens. Um, and uh, these organ donors are raised for the sole purpose of harvesting organs. Um, and this is, as I said, kind of uh, um, 
the conceit of the, the novel, that it's a speculative fiction. It's called uh, Never Let Me Go, which you find out later in the novel is the title of a, a, a song in this fictional universe that the main character really enjoys. Um, and she enjoys it uh, because she imagines that it's the uh, song of uh, a mother, uh, she imagines a vision of a mother holding her baby and thinking, never let me go. Later on, we, we kind of are, are brought to a different reading of this. And uh, this has to do with this question of a kind of duplicitous narrative, that, that we get a first person uh, narrator again, as in the case of the novels that um, Chris talked about, but one that we uh, start distrusting almost from the very beginning. Um, it's uh, been compared to, uh, and the novel came out in 2005, as I said, it's supposed to take place in the 1990s. It's been compared to the short story, The Lottery, um, 1984, Brave New World, and most recently, uh, Dave Eggers, The Circle. So it has that kind of dystopian feel to it, and, except it's not a very good dystopian novel or, or speculative fiction, because quickly you realize that the emphasis is somewhere else. Um, that it's not on the, 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 the sort of plot uh, aspects, but more about the, what this situation does psychologically to people who are thrust into uh, the position, born into the position of uh, being clones for uh, the purpose of eventually having their organs harvested. So I wanted to read to you the opening uh, because I think the, what becomes very clear very quickly to anyone reading this is it's not really science fiction, but it's really uh, uh, this kind of uh, rumination about ethics. And you, f you can kind of feel both things happening in, in the opening uh, uh, paragraph. My name is Kathy H. I'm 31 years old. I've been a carer now for over 11 years. That sounds long enough, I know, but actually they want me to go on for another eight months until the end of the, this year. That'll make almost exactly 12 years. Now I know my being a carer so long isn't necessarily because they think I'm, a, I'm fantastic at what I do. There are some really good carers who've been told to stop just after uh, two or three years, and I can think of one carer at least who went on for all of 14 years despite being a complete waste of space. So I'm not trying to boast, but then I do know for a fact that they've been pleased with my work, and by and large, I have too. My donors have always tended to much better than expected. Their recovery times have been impressive, and hardly any of them have been classified as agitated, even before the fourth donation. Okay, maybe I'm boasting a little bit now. Maybe, uh, but it means a lot to me, being able to do my work well, especially that bit about my donors staying calm. I've developed a kind of instinct around donors. I know when to hang around and comfort them and when to leave them to themselves, when to listen to everything they have to say and when just to shrug and tell them to snap out of it. So here in, in this kind of open, uh, opening paragraph, we have this kind of strange use of words we're familiar with, like donors and, and carers, and we don't really know what's going on. So he, he's, he employs this again and again uh, throughout this novel to kind of drive us into the narrative and, and get us to want to answer these questions and, and figure these things out. Um, and that, in that sense, it's a page turner. It's something he uh, does in uh, his detective fiction later on. Um, and, and mystery kind of fiction, um, who done it, um, and it has that kind of quality to it. But at the same time, we have a person who's very defensive here about their kind of professional, uh, their professional situation. They're, they recognize that they're both good at it, but maybe it's not that they're good at it. And we have to start doubting: Are they actually good at it? What's going on here? Um, and that kind of carries through. Um, this kind of uh, uh, narration style has been described by uh, some critics as kind of robotic, and I think this might get to some of uh, the falseness or mistakes or something that, that Chris was, was, was talking about. Um, uh, not just robotic, but, a, but a, like a simulacrum of, a, of 19th century realism is, is what other people have, have kind of called this, that he's evoking 19th century realism only to kind of hollow it out of any of its uh, Passion is, is sort of the, the critique that, that a lot of people have talked about. Um, you have, though, within this very quickly, as I said, this becomes a kind of novel about ethics. Um, and not just really the ethics of, of uh, the human or uh, what we might think of when, it, when I tell you the kind of plot about clones and uh, orgist uh, donation, but it becomes very quickly a, a, a critique of the ethics of uh, an identity politics because there's no identity, so far as we can tell, of, of these clones. Uh, so it's either sort of post-racial or it's, it's a complete sort of like white fascist 
regime. Uh, it's, it's kind of unclear. Um, but that itself then evokes uh, all kinds of uh, identity politics kinds of reads here. Certainly there's this kind of class relations between the clones and, and the normal citizens um, that, that goes on. Um, but quickly this becomes a kind of critique of the value of art in, in all of this because what we find is special about the narrator and her group of, uh, of um, donors that she grows up with. Um, and you go through a stage, you, you're, you're first a carer, you, you grow up, you, you're a student, and then you're a carer, uh, for other people who are donating, and then eventually you become a don don donator yourself if you're a clone. Um, anyway, this group of people that she grew up with had a very special circumstance, um, and that is that they were asked uh, by the teachers at this, this school um, to create art. And they had art exchanges with each other first, and then the best of the art would, would come and be collected by a woman called Madame. They thought for a gallery that she was creating of all the best art of, of all these people. No one know, really knows why. And this is one of the driving mysteries of the novel. Why are the, is clone art being collected? Um, and uh, we find out later on, uh, and I'll uh, read you a, an, another section of, of the novel, when they finally confront, they catch up to her later in life when they're 30 years old, uh, not no longer children, to, to find out uh, what's going on. And uh, they, they recall in the past at school that one of the teachers mentioned to them, well, it's to prove that you have a soul. And so they asked the teacher, why, do you need, why would you need to prove a thing like that, Miss Emily? Did, uh, did someone think we didn't have souls? A thin smile appeared on her face. It's touching, Kathy, to see you so taken aback. It demonstrates in a way that we did our job well. As you say, why would anyone doubt you had a soul? But I have to tell you, my dear, that it wasn't something commonly held when we first set out all those years ago. And though we've come a long way since then, it's not a notion universally held even today. You Halisham students, that's the name of the school, even after you've been out in the world like this, you still don't know the half of it. All around the country, at this very moment, there are students being reared in deplorable conditions, conditions that you Halisham students could hardly imagine. Now, uh, and now we're no more. Things will only get worse. So this was kind of an experiment that the school was running on, on these uh, children to prove that, if they could prove that they have, uh, uh, that they could make art, that we prove that they sort of have souls. And it, it implicates us, the reader, into uh, questioning the status of the narration itself in the end. Because um, we are being addressed in that first paragraph, as, as I mentioned, as of equal status with the, this woman who's a carer. Um, that is to say, uh, often she'll direct in direct address to us, uh, the, the readers, say, I, I don't know how it was like where you were grown, growing up, uh, in what school you were being brought up, but at Halisham it was this way. And um, this kind of uh, uh, um, refrain ends up uh, kind of us, uh, putting us in a situation both at once of empathy with, with her, but also, as I said, uh, originally kind of uh, sus suspecting where she's coming from. And this is the kind of thing that I think uh, Ishiguro again and again is, is sort of playing with um, in all of the novels I've read, read of, read of uh, his, and uh, it's, it's particularly evident here as he's kind of um, bringing both this kind of human quality and uh, questioning of, of, of the human relation to art and the value of art. In the end, it's not so clear that, that he believes that art actually contains a soul. Um, and at least that's my, my read here. And, and he's very kind of critical of the, the, the notion that it could contain a soul. And therefore, maybe that absolves him of this critique of a kind of robotic performance or simulacrum of a 19th century realist voice. Because maybe he's, he's purposely doing that to kind of teach us that lesson. Thank you. Uh, John, can you tell me where to get one of those clones? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's why we all laugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next we have uh, Carrie Eckhart. Okay. So the book that I'm talking about uh, is called The Berry Giant. Uh, and I'll pass it around at you because I kind of like the cover, even though the cover is not at all accurate. It's one of the many characteristics of the book that may lead you astray a little bit. Uh, the cover image with the chalice, the book has a medieval setting, which I'll explain in a moment. And one might then think 
Oh, it's about the Holy Grail. As far as I can tell, it has nothing whatsoever to do with the Holy Grail. <laughs> and even the term, the buried giant, it's not in any obvious way about a giant, buried or otherwise. Uh, as it turns out, the giant is mentioned towards the end, page 297. The giant, once well buried, now stirs. And the giant who has been buried and will now be aroused represents memory. The novel as a whole deals with the problem of memory and forgetting, which Ishiguro has addressed in other works as well. And here, the focus is on two levels of memory and forgetting. One level deals with the personal and intimate memories that define the relationship of an elderly couple, a wife and a husband, who spent many, many years together. The other level deals with public memories of war, ethnic violence, including the slaughter of innocents who are caught in the midst of civil conflict. And in that context, remembering has the effect of perpetuating hatred from one generation to the next. And Ishiguro is said to have been thinking of Rwanda, Eastern Europe, and other conflict zones, but not to have wanted to address them explicitly. So the setting in this book, The Buried Giant, is far, far away from Rwanda, Eastern Europe, or other contemporary conflict zones. It's post-Roman Britain, uh, probably meant to be in the 6th century Common Era, when the Roman Empire's armies had been departing after several centuries of colonial presence in Britain. And so it's an image of a society after the departure of the empire without a main central government, with many different questions, with different ethnic groups, people speaking different languages, all of that. In the novel, the time turns out to be the generation after the British victory attributed in the Arthurian legend to King Arthur, and that is described as a victory that had established a fragile peace between the two main warring factions, the Britons and the Saxons. In the novel, Arthur himself is now dead or gone, so it's a generation later, although one of his knights is still alive and still pursuing what he takes to have been the Arthurian vision. Now, there's a bit of historical basis for Ishiguro's depiction of a period of peace between Britons and Saxons in the post-Roman era, both archaeological evidence and some of the early documentary evidence from the Arthurian legend suggests that there was a major British victory in the 6th century uh, that then led to a temporary halt in the Saxon advance, after which the Saxon advance continued. Gradually, the Celtic British peoples were pushed to the margins, uh, and there was then the establishment of seven Saxon kingdoms and things of that sort. Uh, that much is history, that there seems to have been some pause in the Saxon advance, though whether there was a British war leader named specifically Arthur, if there was certainly not a king, none of that is substantiated. In other respects, Ishiguro is not aiming at accuracy, other than that one characteristic of the setting, the Saxons, the Britons, and a period of temporary nervous peace. His setting actually comes from a literary context instead. And according to an interview that he gave to The Guardian, for some time they wanted to write a novel about the lone figure of a man on a horse. This medieval setting in particular was Sir Gawain, an Arthurian knight, as the man on the horse, rather than, say, a cowboy from the American West. You can think of a lot of other examples of, the, of a man on a horse. And this particular medieval setting derives from his reading of a 14th century English poem called Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, but is a hero who undertakes a lone journey on a horse through a difficult and threatening landscape. I also hear echoes of Dante and Mallory and other medieval writings, but evidently uh, this was Ishiguro's own access. He had found his man on a horse. In the 14th century English poem, the journey itself that Sir Gawain undertakes is told very, very briefly. You're told only that it's a difficult place, difficult time, extremely cold outside, he had to sleep outside in his armor, and there were various hostile elements. They were ogres and other things he had to fight, but you don't see that happening. And so Ishiguro saw that moment in the medieval poem as an opportunity, let's open up that space. What if we try to fill that in? In the novel, as it turns out, Sir Gawain is not the main character. His quest is very different from that in the 14th century poem. 
His quest relates to the narrative situation within the novel that the ethnic hostilities during that period of temporary peace are kept buried and in fact repressed by a very strange communal loss of memory. This is induced by a fog or a mist that spreads over the whole land and makes people forget. The main characters are the elderly British couple. Their names are Axel and Beatrice, interesting names. They are shunned by their community. They undertake a journey in search of their son, whom they can scarcely remember, but they think he's in a village not far away. But as with many medieval quests, their journey becomes complicated and redirected. As they travel, Axel and Beatrice meet Sir Gowing, Arthur's knight, now awfully old, but still pursuing the final task Arthur had given him, which is to seek the dragon who produces the mist. They also meet Wiestan, who's a Saxon warrior, Edwin, who's a Saxon lad. Remember, they are British, the Saxons would theoretically have been enemies, except during this period of the forgetting peace. Everybody has forgotten the past so they can be at peace. And they meet monks and soldiers and ogres and animals, and there's a dragon. There's a boatman toward the end who ferries people away to an <coughs> otherworldly island. There are many other characters. They're often nameless or puzzling or they're glimpsed only briefly when memories are triggered. In the novel, there's a constant focus on the effort to remember and an awareness that the memories have been lost. And early in the novel, given that Axel and Beatrice are old, one might suspect that there's an allegory going on of the loss of mental faculties due to aging as an Alzheimer's disease. But actually, amnesia seems to affect people of all different ages. For example, Axel and Beatrice live in a community where other members, not only the elderly, promptly forget about people who had been there only a few days before. So that this amnesia seems to be a general social phenomenon. In this country, overlain by that mist or fog from the dragon's breath that takes away memory, when memories do return, they're often blurred, fragmentary, perceived more as emotions than as events, and they're often triggered by a gesture, a posture, a physical sensation, even a smell. You might think of Proust and the taste of the Madeleine. In other words, memory is a very sensory kind of thing. This becomes almost a stylistic convention in the narrative. In one example, Axel is watching Beatrice, and she's walking just slightly away from him. And it says, Beatrice began to make her way towards the cairn. This is a pile of rocks. And something about the way she did so, her shoulders hunched against the wind, caused a fragment of a recollection to stir in the edges of Axel's mind. The emotion it provoked surprised and shocked him, for it entailed distinct shadows of anger and bitterness as Beatrice stopped before the cairn and bowed her head. He felt both memory and anger going firmer, and the fear made him turn away from her. That negativity produced by the memory, the recollection not even yet distinct, uh, but the negativity, the anger, and the fear is recurrent. In public as well as personal context, the recovery of memories is shown to be destructive. At the end, when Wiestan, the Saxon warrior, succeeds in killing Sir Gawain and the dragon, the mist that derived from the dragon's breath dissolves. On a national scale, the result is that the ethnic hatred between the Britons and the Saxons will now be remembered. Peace between the two peoples in the novel requires forgetting that peace will be destroyed, and instead justice, seen as the righting of old wrongs, mandates the pursuit of vengeance. Thus remembering, even if desired by individuals, and I spent a lot of effort trying to remember, may be destructive for nations. The novel does not suggest that the public remembering of ethnic conflict can be followed by reconciliation or forgiveness. Instead, that it will be followed by a resumption of the violence that had temporarily been suspended by society's collective amnesia. As for Axel and Beatrice, they come to understand that Gawain's mission is to protect the dragon, not in standard medieval fashion to kill the dragon, in other words, to allow memory to stay buried a little longer, while Wiestan's mission is to kill the dragon, and Wiestan is the stronger of the two. 
ask them, Beatrice, find now that they remember more things about their own intimate past also. They recall the ways in which they hurt each other. She was briefly unfaithful. He was cruel in not allowing her to visit the grave of their son, who died of the plague. Despite the return of troubling memories, though, they seem to remain devoted to each other. At the end of the novel, Zagawin is dead at Wiestan's hands, the dragon is dead, the buried giant of memory not visually seen in the novel will awaken. An unnamed boatman is going to ferry Beatrice away to an otherworldly island. You can think everything there from the classical Charon, who's also uh, in medieval sources, ferrying the souls to the other world, to the Arthurian island of Avalon, where supposedly Arthur is taken away. But it's not quite clear whether Axel will be able to join her there or not, so the novel ends in a very indeterminate note. I took a brief look at the reception of the work, um, and I looked at reviews when it came out and then at the Nobel website. New Republic. The Berry Giant actually feels very modern. It reprises the same themes Ishiguro has dealt with his entire career. Deeply flawed people grappling with dueling impulses and loyalties to their ideals, identities, and nations. Ishiguro has simply wound back the clock to a time so distant and mythical that he can explore it without as much political baggage. Guardian. Ishiguro is as keen to dodge the label of fantasy as he is to court it. The book can be applied to our own times. The New Yorker, which may be not surprising, didn't like it. Its fictional setting is feeble. Its allegory manages somehow to be at once too literal and too vague, a magic rare but unwelcome. <laughs> <laughs> no well web, no well website, no bell website, 2017. <coughs> This novel explores movingly how memory relates to oblivion, history to the present, and fantasy to reality. So a very mixed response to it. To sum up, Ishiguro's medievalism allows him to address the problem of memory simultaneously on personal and national levels. It also allows him to bypass any of those problems of factual accuracy that Chris was mentioning because if the setting is clearly not only long ago, but almost as if it were science fiction, far away and drawn from the literary reimagining by the 14th century poem Sir Gowan in the Green Knight, the actual medieval post-Roman time was long, long, long ago. You are no longer expected to be accurate because there isn't really much to be accurate about. That's not the concept that's operating. The narration, in this case, is split among multiple first-person narrators. And so you get a whole variety of different perspectives, including finally the boatman who is going to take Beatrice away. The narration is too fragmented to say that Ishiguro argues for any position about personal and public memory. Instead, it seems appropriate to say that on the one hand, he depicts the ability of strong, intimate, personal bonds to sustain love between individuals despite hurtful memories, and that suggests some extent of optimism. On the other hand, he depicts a destructive impact of awakening public memories of ethnic conflict, hurt, and harm. The latter implication may be very unpopular now, when in many social and political contexts there's a focus now precisely on recovering the memory of past ethnic and other conflicts, whether to seek reconciliation or to try to prevent recurrence. So the medieval setting and the archaic distancing, he also has some archaic use of language here and there, allow Ishiguro to suggest respect for the uses of forgetting and caution about awakening the buried giant of memory, but without commenting directly on any contemporary issues. One strength of the novel, to me at least, though I'm not quite sure why it would have won the Nobel Prize, but one strength is that it nevertheless seems courageous rather than evasive, and I've been trying to puzzle out how does it achieve that in not taking a stand and in not requiring the reader to do so also. That's it. And last but not least, we have Anna Stanton.
Thank you. Um, so Rebecca Walkowitz, for those of you who know her work, she's a scholar of world literature, translation studies, um, Anglophone primarily, um, has written about Kazuo Ishiguro as a paradigmatic example of an author whose work is born translated. This is sort of her phrase, right? Born translated. It's one that she sort of repurposed in a couple of different articles and most recently a book that came out, um, I believe, in 2015. So for, for her, um, Ishiguro is sort of this, this paragon of this born translated status. Um, and she identifies this quality with four particular features when it comes to his writing. Uh, first of all, he writes in English, but with a view toward readers in non-Anglophone contexts. And she, she knows this because he's given a lot of interviews, as I think we sort of gather that he's quite sort of public about his, his, um, his role as a writer. He's given interviews in a number of different Anglophone um, publications over the years, and he's talked about how he wants his work to be received in other places through translation. Um, and in other languages. So this is her first quality, right? He writes in English, but with a view toward readers elsewhere. Um, he also writes in a language other than his native one. Um, debatably, his, na his native language is Japanese, or it's the first language that he learned to speak, although, um, as someone mentioned earlier, he, or I think as you mentioned in the introduction, he came to, the, to, uh, to England when he was five, um, so learned English quite early. But in any event, he has this kind of hybrid language quality um, of both Japanese and English, in, in his background at least. Um, Three, that he sometimes creates characters whose dialogue is represented in English, but we're meant to understand that they're actually speaking another language. Um, I think particularly Japanese, again. Um, so this is another sort of feature that she identifies with these kinds of born translated novels, that they represent languages within languages that are other than what they really are, if that makes sense. Um, and then finally, and probably the sort of most interesting and richest of these, um, of these qualifiers, at least to my mind, um, is that his novels, she writes, deal um, sort of topically and thematically with questions of circulation, transmission, um, and this problematic of originality, which I think probably is most obvious in the novel that um, John talked about a minute ago, this question of clones um, who are themselves sort of unoriginal or debatably original and what happens when they become capable of producing original creative work on their own. It kind of problematizes this question of original and copy, right? Um, or original and translation, if you will, on sort of a number of different levels. Um, and I think some of these other features of his work that we've been talking about um, today also kind of fall into this, under this kind of umbrella of what Walkowitz is interested in. Um, this question of the kind of cliched aesthetics, right? That these are, this is a kind of aesthetics that's meant to travel or meant to be sort of intelligible um, in a broad framework. Um, this absence of sort of, um, a definitive kind of placement, either in like physical placement in space, but also in time, the kind of displacement or distemporality maybe um, of some of his work, the narration style, if it's robotic or if it's, you know, sort of generic in certain sorts of ways. Um, these are features that she would sort of associate with this kind of quality of these novels that exist kind of um, nowhere and everywhere at the same time. Um, so this is all from, from her, her book, um, Born Translated, which I mentioned, um, and elsewhere she's referred to his novels, and this is sort of where I'm going with, with what I want to say about, um, about his work. She's referred to his novels as compelling examples of the new world literature and of what I call comparison literature, an emerging genre of world fiction for which global comparison is a formal as well as a thematic preoccupation. These are Walkowitz's words. That's from an earlier article from 2007. Um, so I'm interested specifically in this intersection of translation and comparison, or maybe more specifically translatability and comparability um, that his work perhaps represents um, or embodies in certain ways. Um, so if we accept Walkowitz's premise in any event that his, his writing, Ishiguro's writing, and the writing of other authors in a certain category, if we want to sort of think that there's a category of new writing here, um, if we accept her premise that his writing requires the critic to invent new categories of literature and also new theoretical frameworks, um, then I suggest that it might also invite us to reconsider the contemporary worldliness of the literary as a function of a certain kind of activity or activeness on the part of the text itself, um, hence translatability and comparability, right? That I'm thinking about this, these, these particular words and this kind of suffix, right? How does something gain an ability to be translated or gain an ability to be compared? That these are not sort of static states um, but rather something 
that's maybe more we can think of it, of, of, um, of it as texts existing in a condition of being receptive to translation and to comparison, a kind of ongoing sort of reproducing or reproducible kind of function that these texts inhabit. Um, and so Walkowitz offers one means of talking about the ways by which a literary text reaches out to the world um, to assert its own flexibility, changeability, malleability, um, maybe porosity, if we want to think about texts as having sort of a spatial component that things can sort of move in and out of the borders of what we think of as a text. Um, its dislocation from national or linguistic canons, its potential to become more than what it at first appeared to be. Um, yet it also strikes me that to think of translatability and comparability in the case of Ishigoro's works or those of any other writer, we must first recognize these states of being as indicative of a kind of ongoing process um, that move us from considering the text as a static or stable object to theorizing it as an object, sort of always in motion in a particular kind of way in which it moves between the local and the global, um, but maybe is always sort of in between. It's always sort of both of those things at once, right? It's always kind of local and, and global, translated and not translated, um, sort of constituted in some ways as a literary work um, in the kind of moment or instantiation of its transformation into something else. And this is some of the quality of what Walkowitz is trying to get at, um, but I think there's even more to sort of do with these questions um, or this sort of this, this kind of proposal that she makes, this kind of intervention or whatever, this problematic that she offers us. Is Ishiguro's writing symptomatic of something different, something new, a particular way that literature today becomes worldly? Um, linguistically, but also in terms of its possibilities of reception and translation. So my sort of final question then, or set of questions would be, um, what does the, what is the this quality of these texts, um, what does it do for, or maybe also do to, uh, the critic who studies them, or also the translator? Uh, how can the critic and translator themselves be brought into motion, or brought into this kind of process of transformation through their encounters with these texts? Um, and rather than considering the moment of critical analysis, or likewise the moment of translation, as the time when the literary text becomes fixed, when it sort of freezes in its motion, when it's captured within a theoretical apparatus or within a new language, um, or pinned down by these choices that the human agent who works on it, right? We often talk about working on texts, right? As if the human, the agent here is doing something to the text um, that's inscribing it within a particular kind of discourse or sort of locking it into a particular kind of position. Um, whether theoretically or whether, you know, through the process of, processes of translation. Translation is often talked about as a series of choices, right? The translator has to go word by word and make a decision for each word. Okay, now, in, in the sense that it's often thought of as kind of closing down options, right? So if a word in a particular language offers kind of a multitude of synonyms and the translator picks one, writes it down, and then that, that word has been sort of fixed in place. But I'm wondering if we can sort of, if these kinds of texts such as Ishiguro's, which are already, in some sense, translated or translatable if they ask us to kind of think differently about those processes. Um, and um, to ask, uh, so if these texts are already both translatable and comparable, what does it do to our notions of translation and comparison um, in terms of the field, in terms of the kind of scholarship um, that they might invite, um, in terms of also the kinds of reading that they might <coughs> engender, um, and then sort of as a final question, so Walkowitz's scholarship focuses primarily on Anglophone novels, or exclusively really, um, on Anglophone novels, and so I'm wondering how does um, a text like, like um, Remains of the Day, for example, or maybe even particular, particularly Never Let Me Go, and I mention these novels as well because they've also, as you both mentioned, exist in film forms, which is a kind of translation in itself. Um, they've sort of moved media. Um, so how, do, how can we turn some of these questions around as well to look at works that are not Anglophone, um, that, whose comparability and translatability and the kind of conditions of those qualities manifest differently and come out of different cultural contexts and different, linguistics, different linguistic contexts, um, and which therefore might necessarily also elaborate different possibilities for us as readers, critics, or translators as we, as we engage them. Um, so that's what I have. All right, we have a few minutes left for questions, so if you have any questions you would like to direct to the entire panel or to a particular speaker.
so yeah, I have one to a particular speaker and, um, and then one to everybody. So the first one is to our first speaker and it's about this kind of um, love-hate relationship with the remains of the day. And actually maybe it's for all, everybody, maybe both questions are for everybody. I just find it really interesting that when Pico Iyer, now I'm doing this from memory and my memory's crap, but in 1989 he wrote an article, I think it was in Time, that kind of brought the notion of post-colonialism to the public and one of his key texts was The Remains of the Day. And I just find that so weird and I'm wondering if there's a kind of accessibility to the remains of the day that um, in the sense that it's it's key ethical details are around the Second World War and the you know in the sense that its key characters are almost of a stereotype and I just found it so weird that they would that Pico I would pick on this as one of those post-colonial texts so I'm just wondering if that history of Kazuo uh, Ishiguro as a kind of at least participating at one point in this huge popular reception of the notion of post-coloniality is kind of just weird or what one might have to say about that. And then the second question is more of a based on a confession which is I like Ishiguro but I find him really deeply influenced by Kutsia and I find myself deeply disappointed because he's not as good as Kutsia. So I have to just confess that right off the bat. But then I go to this question of translatability and I see so many connections between them it's very hard for me to not, not see an influence. I mean there's Beatrice and of course there's Dante but that also comes from Age of Iron and then there's this desire not to pick a particular space and time and those same ethical questions were rehearsed ad infinitum by Nate, Dean Gordimer and others when um, Waiting for the Barbarians came up. So I sort of just wonder if this the questions you aren't asking also um, don't belong to an, an earlier moment and this is a kind of reprisal of them in the form of Ishiguro. I know we don't believe in originals anymore but I'm kind of thinking that a lot of these questions have been rehearsed in relation to Kutsia. Now Kutsia is difficult because not only is he completely bilingual, he's like quadro quintilingual and part of the stuff that you were talking about Anna it comes out in the fact that you don't collect the puns in the English unless you know the other languages. So there's definitely a very concrete form of what you were talking about there. So those are just my two questions. You should be on the panel. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I was struck by listening to everybody and thank you to all of my colleagues here yes. because it, it, uh, I thought that they went together in an interesting way and we should write an article about <laughs> academic hostility to um, Ishiguro because in some ways he seems to dismiss what we do, right? Sort of know things about the past, retrieve memory, be accurate, imagine that knowing things is going to make the world a better place. Yes. Um, sort of, How naive. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's anti-humanist. Yeah, it is anti-humanist in a way. Right, it's either naive or very sophisticated. I'm not sure. I was Maybe we're the naive. Oh, we're the naive ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, and I don't know the article that you're talking about. I find it... I mean, unless your idea of post-colonialism is just... No, it's not my idea. This was No, no, time. right, I understand. Yeah. But uh, unless one's idea of post-colonialism is just making Britain seem ridiculous... Um, you I know. think so. The fact that it was an American publication means yeah. that, you know, this touches on Anna's question of how books start to play their afterwards out in politics, which... Right. Yeah. Well, and the sort of idea of Ishiguro as not a British figure, when he's so British, I mean, his whole education is British, and his, you know, all of his colleagues are British, and all these people weighing in to congratulate Ish on his Nobel Prize. Congratulate Ish. <laughs> um, uh, be devastating, yeah? Uh, so, I mean, I, you know, in some ways, we're the wrong audience. For this and I think you know your idea that you can find other books that do this better I have to say my rereading of Shiguro this weekend was undercut by the fact that later this evening I'll be teaching Monique Trong's The Book of Salt which is a similar kind of book by someone who emigrated to the West as a child and is kind of imagining uh, a different kind of history and to me it's so much better um, so uh, so you know I don't I, just kind of yes, I mean, and I think in some ways either he's a very, either it's, a, I mean, it doesn't really matter obviously what his intention is. The texts work as sort of undermining what it is we do, 
and we we can be hostile about that, and maybe we are. <laughs> but I think also this the latest book, and by the way, it is post-colonial in the literal, literal sense, right? A very giant because it is set in Britain in the post-Roman Empire colonial period. I I think it also may be reasserting his Englishness or Britishness because the use of the Arthurian legend puts him into that series of canonical folks from Spencer onward, Tennyson and Matthew Arnold and T.S. Eliot and a whole bunch of Dante. Them. <laughs> <laughs> but if we're thinking of to what extent is it claiming a kind of Englishness in a special way versus mm -hmm. claiming a kind of worldedness, or maybe not versus, but maybe one of those mm -hmm. is a means of access to gotcha. the other. I think that one of the things that he might be doing is sort of reasserting, I am now behaving like at least some of the other major British writers. So I keep thinking he could have chosen a lot of other opportunities for the man on the horse. Which also brings up the question of imitation. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, is it, is it British or English? Good question. Why does it matter? Well, it's certainly Ask matters. the Irish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> why, why the Welsh? Or the Scots? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, it's part of the sort of studied imprecision that you you mentioned at the very start, Chris. I mean, after all, when, they, when the butler gives us the false derivation of Great Britain, right? Uh, I mean, you know, that's as, that's as bad as the, uh, as the, as the grammar error, right? Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of what, you know, what, I, what I've heard people talking about is sort of recuperation of uh, invidious class distinctions. One thing that, Anna, your comments remind me of is, is in Japan, uh, there's uh, a perception, uh, right after uh, the announcement was won, there was a kind of mass disappointment because for a long time people have been expecting if a Japanese person wins, it's gonna, going to be Murakami Haruki. And uh, there were articles to the effect of who is Ishiguro. So uh, even though his books are translated, he's not particularly popular in, in, in Japan. Um, but along with the kind of discussions of why Murakami is popular outside of uh, Japan goes a, 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 a word in Japanese which is called mukokuse, which literally means uh, lack of nationality. Mm. Um, and that he's able to denuder his texts of any sort of sense of nationality. And then, so there's all these debates about his use of proper names. Uh, specifically, and so the proper names that that Murakami uses are ones that are globally familiar. So he talks about Miles Davis and spaghetti, and you know the, the things that sort of circulate on a global scale. But he doesn't talk about uh, specific histories and stuff, at least in his early work. And then he does later on because he's crit criticized for that. But I wonder. I mean, in a way, Ishiguro's what did, what did you call it? Uh, uh, intentional translation ease or something? Uh, 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 yeah. Cause Anyway, that, that's sort of, yeah. he, he uses proper names, but mm -hmm. improperly, <laughs> like he uses these histories, he draws on all these things and kind of plays with them to sort of signify them to those of us in the English world who know some history, I guess, of Anglo-Saxon mm -hmm. or whatever, but never, it, it, it doesn't matter, it's enough to just kind of drop it in, yeah. it's name dropping, mm -hmm. you know, in its mm -hmm. ultimate form, and maybe that's the same with Godzilla, he's sort of yeah. choosing this like, global version of Japan that everyone knows, and it doesn't matter if it's 54, even though the book is 48. But. Yeah. And I guess the kind of the critique of that would be to call it sort of like lightweight, right? That there's something in the way he sort of gestures at these things. He sort of gives you just enough, right? Mm -hmm. Just enough of a context, just enough of a space, just enough of a language to sort of get a flavor, right? But not actually go all the way. I mean, this would be the sort of, you know, if we wanted to sort of, not that we should sort of write him off or even be like invested in that gesture of writing anybody off but like to say oh he's he's only sort of it's sort of partial what he does right he's not sort of yeah which I think it also is to this question of um, of literature that circulates in particular kinds of ways maybe partly because it's kind of neutered of these kind of particularities um, that there's something maybe interesting but is there the generous to side of that Anna that he mm. is deliberately making them um, 
slightly inaccurate or, or wobbly in order to send up the notion of authenticity, which is exactly what right. makes them to some degree translatable. I mean, right. they're part, two parts of the same Absolutely. coin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that would be the ungenerous gesture to say yeah. that it's lightweight. But what does that even, I mean, right, like what, it, but that also then calls into the into question, is there a literature that, that isn't, or why is that an important question, or why is this question exactly. being historically accurate? Why would we even expect this from a literary work? Why does it need to do that for us? Um, in order to be considered serious or in order to be valued, you know, sort of period. All right, well, it looks like we are out of time, so let's thank our panel members. Thank you. Thank you.